I choose me. It's just really about trying to do whatever it is that I do at a level of excellence, and that's really all I'm trying to do. You got lucky, man. In a, in a way. Well, you know, that had a that had a piece. I worked and increased my chances of that luck happening. I never formulated what could happen and what would happen. I learned that much later, that I could write down what I wanted and be deliberate in my dreams and, and wishes. I've been thinking a lot recently about what it actually takes for someone to get really good at something. There's a lot of good guidance about how many hours or years of commitment that achieving what we might call mastery can actually take. But when we're talking about creative pursuits, I think there's so much that takes place away from the desk and so much that has to happen within that subconscious imaginary space that actually I think it becomes way less relevant to think of it as this time commitment and more valuable to think about it as a holistic way of being or how you structure your life. Just knowing how much I just think about music, someone brought it to my attention, it's all I think about. It consumes me, it consumes my life, I, I breathe it. I can't think about nothing else. That focus and drive that you have to pursue this thing that you love, often for free, is obviously a massively valuable part of your life and identity. But when we're trying to will those projects into being and balancing that with all the rest of life's concerns, it's not unusual that the intensity can create distance between our own priorities and the priorities of others. Look, when you think successful female artists in America, you think Beyonce, Christina Aguilera. These are all very kind of polished images, but you yourself have come out doing, you know, you didn't, you defied convention. I'm not really fussed. I'm very lucky that I got to make the kind of album I wanted to make. That's pretty much it. The rest of it, I'd tell everyone to look off, so. Maybe you found yourself having to build walls around your work or close relationships have felt strained because of the way that you're prioritizing that creative practice. I mean, the, the relationships come and go, and, but what I get from it is, is the songs, and the songs are my way of, of kind of myth, mythologizing my own past and kind of keeping a pulse running through my past so that the songs themselves become, they're more real to me than, than the actual events themselves. Maybe you've made career decisions in order to free up time to do that work that you're really passionate about. But as life starts to gather momentum around you, questions are starting to form from yourself and from others around whether those were the best choices to make. I can remember living in a bed sit for a long time, really struggling, just about scraping it for anything. <laughs> you know, it was hard. You wouldn't have been able to have a child. Yeah, that's true. The child is a luxury that is only afforded to me because of my success. It's true. And you might, people might necessarily want a relationship with you. It takes a certain kind of partner mm. to deal with that. So in this video, we're going to be looking at examples of successful artists and thinking about what it might actually mean to structure our life around making the best work that we can. Because of the issues that this video is dealing with around personal identity and how we structure our lives. I really welcome people to view this with a certain healthy level of critical distance and also wholeheartedly invite other ways that you might form this discussion in your heads yourself. And with that invitation and acknowledgement that everything that you're about to see is channeled through this single perspective, let's jump into it. Nobody told me that this would be I give up sometimes, but not when you need me. If it was my choice, we never have. So, I wanted to open this video talking about fantasy and the simple truth that, in order for us to put the kind of time and energy into the creative projects that that work's going to require, we may have to live outside of the classic shared incentive structures of society and put a lot of value on things that are hard to quantify or see replicated in the spaces around us. Your experience coming up in music was unique and, and it doesn't happen that often where you come up yourself picking yourself up from the trenches in a way and building your own thing. Is that yeah. accurate to what you did, um, you think? Well, yeah, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, you know, but honestly, I think that the way the universe is so 
and chaotic and random that, that a lot of that had a factor to play with it. You got lucky, you mean, in, it, a, in a way. Well, you know, that had a that had a piece. I'd been making music for, you know, eight years. I worked and increased my chances of that luck yeah. happening. You've made 15 mixtapes in the past full of lyrics that you believe, if you keep working on them, could change the world. But it's this 16th one that's really going to connect and break through. You've had an idea for an art installation and you're spending 800 quid on a 14 foot piece of reclaimed steel. Because even though you've never seen this done in reality, you're extremely sure that this is going to be an important and powerful expression. There's a lot of engines that we can rely on as artists and creatives. The love of the craft perhaps, or support and collaboration of people around us. But when you're sitting up at four in the morning trying to figure out that song you're working on, or disappearing on your lunch break to work on that novel you've been writing for over a decade, then a commitment and belief to things that only exist within your own head is actually probably going to be quite important. Because I felt like for years, this is years of work and years of me knowing that this is what I'm supposed to do. I think when you believe in yourself, then you know. Like, you just know. So even when you're working a part-time job and you're getting paid $8 an hour and you're like, damn, I don't want to be here, you know. If you truly know what's coming, then you don't mind doing that. I'm closer. I'm closer. Today, I'm closer than I was yesterday. And it's that mentality that's going to get you through it. We know that if we want to achieve the greatness that we're looking for in our work, then we're going to have to live outside sometimes of those more predictable parts of reality and lean a long way into that belief and those convictions. I don't know if it's about me, but I think just creativity in general, um, just doing what you want is so important. I want people to know that I'll continue doing that. No matter what the f they think I should make, I'll always make what I want to make and what I feel is, is the tightest sh So it's here that I want to bring in one of the world's favorite artists, or perhaps someone who used to fit in that list, and that's Frank Ocean. Sunday's headliner was the hugely anticipated Frank Ocean, who was back on stage for the first time in seven years. The show started nearly an hour late, mm -hmm. with lots of people scrambling to put the stage together. One account that reports on festival news on Twitter says Frank changed his mind at the last minute and demanded an entirely new stage setup. You. What wow. a disappointment. Yes. He, didn't, he didn't perform. Um, he didn't perform thinking about you, that, which like is you were waiting for. One I know, song. but that's very Frank Ocean of him to sort of like not give you what you want. We're paying mm -hmm. you that kind of money. I, you know. Now, I didn't pay any of my hard earned money to go to Coachella and see Frank Ocean. But afterwards, all I could really think was after many years of trying to create a bit more space for himself and some distance from popularity or the crowd, Frank had finally actually gone some way to achieve this. Frank Ocean being kind of standoffish and uh, not presenting himself in a very kind of clear or concrete way, that, that's just really kind of a very Frank Ocean thing to do, including, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, having this live stream not go down. Because again, that would make it easier for people to kind of like make sense of or interpret or see some kind of like clarity of his actions or performance or, or whatever. And, and Frank is always doing whatever he can to sort of just hang in the shadows. Now, I don't know Frank and I don't know what he thinks, but listen to his albums and that level of writing, which is obviously at the heart of his creative identity, it's clear to hear the amount of work that goes into that. Now, in the past, I've heard Frank talk about how he may have some desires to be a fiction writer in the future. And I think this really is quite interesting because it shows his creative nature. His best work comes from sitting in that creative bubble with the writing and he recognizes that everything else is kind of just offering a distraction to that. My right hand, hand to God, left hand holding the juice. Sorry. I'm just a perfectionist, man. Like, and I'm kind of like bougie when it comes to Sonics and ish and, and you know, everything. You know, not just the Sonics, but I take my time. Some songs come quick, Swim Good came quick. I wrote that in like half an hour. You know, um, American Wedding took me a week and a half. You know, it really just depends on, you know, what the story is and and just getting that muff, like a lyric sheet to read correctly. When thinking about focus, 
and what this level of work might require of us, I want to bring in the idea of the auteur. So this is a concept that's used in film to describe a director who can be seen to have influence over every aspect and every choice that's made up that final product. Now, as an independent artist, I think this idea of auteurship is actually really useful to understand and think about because the simple fact is at every level of a project from inception to execution it very well might be you that is the only one who cares about getting it finished to that standard that you envision in your head there was a point in this book where i realized i had taken a bad turn and it was just about eight months of work and i realized to really get to where you need to go, sometimes you, you must um, run through the other options. There was no way that I could have gotten to that point had I not spent those eight months. They're invisible, they're not in the book, but I needed to spend them in order to be where, to, to, to get to where I was. It's in this necessary ownership that it takes for the individual to achieve that high level of finish on a creative project that we can see quite easily that taking a relaxed approach to making great work just isn't really going to be realistic so as well as having quite a lot of belief in the work that others may not share we also have to approach it with a kind of hyper focus that can easily be read as obsessive this is where that further level of disconnection can be seen to take place and the artist might be read as acting strangely or putting up walls between themselves and the world around them and perhaps pushing other people away. I worked on a lot of it while I was living in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. which was, uh, um, when I was living in New York, I think was the most like secluded that I've been. Mm -hmm. um, I needed that in a way just to like figure out what I wanted to do next, you know what I mean? And, and um, it was just a whole bunch of stuff up here, you know what I mean? Where I'm like, I need to be locked away in my creative space because I'm a creative person and no one understands me. All that whole, like, self-destruction and, 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 you know, it was wild to be around me for a while. You know what I mean? Like, especially in my creative space, it's like, it was weird to be around what happened me. In that clip from Mac, we can see both uh, awareness of the kind of focus that it takes for him to get his best work done, as well as an acknowledgement of how this way of living in the world might end up isolating himself from others. Now, the story of Mac Miller's journey with that connection to his work is a far deeper one. And if you want to have a look at that further, I'm gonna link my video series on Mac at the end of this video. But in this piece now, I wanna start looking at how we can take our awareness of these possible places of tension and disconnection and start looking at our own work, thinking about ideas around identity and how we move through the world and communicate to others and create an environment where we can not only feel fulfilled and somewhat at peace, but we can also end up over time doing our greatest work. No, I, I, didn't, need, I, don't, I didn't need children to fulfill me. I didn't need relationships to fulfill me. I needed you all to fulfill me on stage, right. you know, but along with that comes love and relationships and pregnancy and, and sex and, and relationships and those things. So those are my circumstances in my life, you know, but never, I've never you know, formulated what could happen and what would happen. You know, I, I learned that much later, that I could write down what I wanted and be deliberate in my uh, dreams and, and wishes. Now, this is where I want to talk about the value of journaling. A consistent journaling practice might seem like some kind of subsidiary process to actually taking part in the creative work. But we need to remember here that there's no point loading up the car with loads of energy and fuel and getting on that road if we don't know where we're trying to go. So in this video, we're going to look at two questions that can be really useful in terms of doing this valuable reflective work. But for links to loads more questions and discussion on the value and use of journaling in our creative journey, I've put a whole section in this week's free newsletter, which you can find linked below. Right, let's jump into question one now. I wanted to start with something that we might see as just basic inventory. In terms of the goal of making the most valuable and fulfilling work you can, 
Make a list of activities, relationships and time commitments that feed this work and a list of those things that perhaps don't. Now this is a very central question to consider when we think about structure in our life around doing our best work. And it also might be one where you start considering other important questions around it. What kind of work are you trying to do for example? And where do you put these areas of your life that seem really time consuming and hard to deal with but actually lead to the kind of growth or relationship building that might actually be the basis of the value of your creative output. Well, we were talking backstage a little bit because our kids are almost the same age about the difficulties of being an artist and being a mother at the same time. I think a lot of people have faced those hurdles and not everybody has figured out how to deal with it. And there's a sense of identity shift that comes with that. Is that something you're figuring out now? Yeah. It was really way harder than um, I thought. I thought also that maybe I would get cured of my hunger and ambition, but it totally like blew it up. <laughs> I was really, really insecure and really scared, but also really hungry. So it was an interesting time to just like throw myself out there and, and start over but also tricky with the whole time thing. Go check out that newsletter if you want to look at some other questions around this issue and stick about for the next section where we're going to look at some examples of different artists who can look to as possible models of success. Right, jumping on to question two now. And this is something that fairly recently helped me do some positive reflecting on my own creative practice. And the question goes something like this. If you project yourself forward a year or 18 months, and look back, what's gonna make you feel most satisfied and happiest with in terms of how you managed your time and your creative work across that period? Now, I quite like this one because it can lead to just some practical weighing out of different options in terms of managing our time. For me, it was a case of, I was spending quite a long time on a fitness hobby, as well as trying to balance it with my work. And that was not leaving a lot of space for me to take on some creative projects I wanted. Although I enjoyed the fitness thing and it made me feel good, when I projected myself forward and thought about where I would have actually wanted to spend all that time, I realized that it wasn't really bringing me any kind of positive social interaction or pushing forward the creative things that I actually see as most valuable to me. Now balancing those time commitments in a positive way is a journey that everyone goes on and it's also impossible often to look back and objectively know whether you got something right or wrong. But I think those are the reasons why that consistent weekly or monthly journaling and reflective process can be so useful. Okay, we're gonna move on to those three models of success now. But after talking about that specific thing in my own experience, I thought this was a good opportunity to ask anyone watching if there's anything specifically in what we've been talking about that's felt relevant or resonated with you. What are the methods that you've used in the past to try and organize your life more positively around your work? And are there ways in which you make those tough gray area decisions about what things in your life are adding or detracting from the value of that creative output that you're able to make? I'd sort of say my rout the, the routine that I've started to become aware of, um, you know, that's quite i've realized over the years actually quite fundamental um to how i work is is actually being deliberately very lazy for a long time um you know and it's it just seems to be the way um i kind of store up information and energy um to like not to try and be entertained by a lot of things not to try and be kind of searching for inspiration constantly not be you know um, not be giving yourself a really hard time as well because with that comes a real a baggage and a weight of expectation and um, you know that doesn't mean I'm not doing anything there's like you know I will be I don't not I do work a little bit but um, I'm kind of gathering and then when I get to the studio I feel like I've you know, I purposely pick a time when I've kind of feel like I've yeah you know, I've I feel like I've got enough energy and I've got enough um, enough about me to 
and it, that comes from being lazy rather than being really prolific <laughs> i think <laughs> okay huge shouts to you if you got this far and in this final section as promised i'm going to be bringing in three models of artists who have reached mastery in their craft and look at their own relationship with their creative process and how the way they move through the world has allowed them to reach those heights the first artist that i want to pull in here is someone who's been featured a couple of times already on the channel and that's Erica Badu. To me, Erica is an artist who seems to have a very grounded and healthy relationship and identification with their creative work. It's important to recognize, however, that even as an artist who has proven the value of her work in the public realm, she's also spoke about how she's had to drive in boundaries with other people around that creative practice and move through the world in a way that forces other people to change the preconceptions they might have around her and allow her then to live her life in the way that feels real to her. Yeah, because when they gave you trucks and cars, they gave me dolls and kitchens. That's right. We were, our conditioning was conditioned. We were conditioned to That's be right. that way. So we thought we were failures if we weren't able to fulfill those conditions, you mm -hmm. know, in our circumstance. But, you know, I've learned that that does not fit my spirit does it does not fit my being erica teaches us the importance of being cognizant and managing the way people see us in the world and provides that positive example of someone who has taken ownership about how they want to live and by consistently moving through the world in that way has built a life where a lot of people come around and support that part of herself and are forced to at least respect it well, only after I became pregnant, like I told you, when other people started to, you know, place their own opinions. And, right. But, but before that, no, I didn't have any doubt. I, I loved Andre. I loved our union. I loved what we had. Right. Whether we would be together forever or not, this is who we are and what we're having. This is a thing in a life. Right. You know, a, a being, you know, and my mind just works that way. But I didn't have any doubts about that until other people were saying, oh, your career, and you do this, and he too young, and you too young. Da, da, da. So those things started, I was young, so right. those things started to trickle through me, and I had to fight through them. Right. I had to fight through them, and you have to fight through them. You do. There's no, there's no easy route to believing in yourself. Right. You have to develop it. It's like a muscle. You have to believe in it, you know, but you have to, to be aggressive you know, with the love that you have for yourself. The next artist that I want to pull in here is someone that I wanted to look at in terms of better understanding that question we had around what inputs do we need in order to feed the value of our creative work. Juno Diaz is a Pulitzer Prize winning fiction writer whose work is deeply rooted in explorations of individual identity, but also family relationships and wider societal issues. When we hear Diaz speak about his work and himself, we can see how he doesn't define himself solely as a writer. In fact, sometimes he seems to even be downplaying that aspect of his identity and speaking passionately about his role as a teacher, activist, and passionate reader. What's your, what's your process like? How do you go from blank page from zero to one? I used to be, and I'm starting to move back to it, I used to be the lunch pail writer. I think that yeah. ultimately, having spent over a decade trying to figure out some other way of doing this, I realized that for me, that's not working. Um, the waiting for inspiration to strikes isn't, isn't providing what I need. So the way I used to do it was, and I'm starting to do it again, was I would wake up in the morning, have my coffee, work. And by me waking up in the morning is always like quarter to six. By noon, I'm done. Call it a day. And that's what I'm getting back to now. What are you um, doing? At, what are you doing at one o'clock? If you're done by noon, if you're done well, by I, noon. I've got my university responsibilities. <laughs> oh, <laughs> got it. okay, yeah. got it. You have your day job, right? The weird thing about writing is it's sort of like being an athlete. The game is only a little bit of it. I spend the next, I spend at least three or four hours a day reading, because if you're not reading you ain't going to do nothing. You know, it's, it's sort of like if you're in the if you're in the news biz and you ain't following the news, I mean, how are you going to get out and talk about it? So yeah. the the background work you do 
So I read a lot, a lot, a lot. Here we see an artist who's explicit about how his own work and his output wouldn't exist with anything like the same kind of value if it wasn't being consistently fed by these other important sides to his identity. In order to write the book you want to write, Diaz says, in the end, you have to become the person you need to become to write that book. So I had this great thing where I, had, I wrote a book in 1996, and then um, that was it. I, I spent the next 11 years having like no career. And it was awesome because, you know, I got this little burst of attention, and then I proceeded to lose whatever, like when I hear my students talking, my students have all this professional language. They're all ready to be famous. So they're like, yeah, you lost all your momentum. <laughs> okay, that's what we had. Uh -huh. I didn't want to hear myself saying, you've got to publish this fast, you've got momentum. Uh, okay. Strike while people know who you are. <laughs> hey, this would be great time. If you wrote a really great novel now, as opposed to any time. I didn't write anything useful till that voice died. So that voice no longer had control of the board, where it was no longer saying, do this fast or do this well. When I finally set, heard the voice go, well, you should just write the fucking bad book that you knew you were gonna write because you suck. I was like, go, you know? for real. To finish this piece, I wanted to bring in the voice of another writer and that's the author of A Little Life, Hanya Yanagihara. To me, the formation of that novel, A Little Life, and how Hanya discusses the process of that work is a really great reframing of the creative process, which from the outside may seem like something that is toxic or selfish, when actually it can be viewed as an act of connection with the audience, and not to be too prosaic, but an act of service. I wrote my second novel, A Little Life, Hanya said, in what I still think of as a fever dream. For 18 months, I was unable to properly concentrate on anything else. So that's that period of time where we might seem disconnected from the world around us, or we might turn down the invite to our friend's wedding, or fall asleep on the table at work because we've been sitting up all night working on that passion project. From the outside, that can easily look like we're putting up walls or pulling into ourselves or our relationship to our works becoming obsessive. But with Hanya's process, we can see how the resulting outcome, the piece of work at the end of it, was able to actually connect with a group of people, a group of readers, in a way that was highly, highly valuable. This book, touched the lives of so many people. So many people love this book. I wonder how much pressure, therefore, you feel in bringing it to the stage. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege to be a part of this production. And, and the reason is, is because of the number of people who have, as you say, loved this book and been so affected by it. In this upcoming interview clip, Hanya speaks about how she framed that process to herself, looking at it in this way that actually feels highly grounded and connected and engaged with the world and others. When I turned in this book, I remember telling my editor that it was very much a book that I wrote for me and my best friend, and that was it. And I sort of thought it might find a few hundred readers who felt really passionately about it, who felt that this book was speaking directly to them, and it felt like a secret to them. And for everyone else, they wouldn't see it. But for the few hundred people who did, that it would feel like it said something about life that they didn't know that they wanted to say. And that would have been perfectly fine, and I would have been overjoyed with that. Right, that's probably enough of me talking about this today. But again, over to you on this one. If there's anything that's come up for you around these discussions, or places where you might describe your own experience in very different language, or a different perspective to what I've put down here. Do reach out and share this with a fellow creative or friend if you found it useful. And yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. If it was my choice, we never have pain or time. And we lift and we pick everyone up when